Hello, everybody. We're about to go over uh, part one of the chapter 14 review exercises for um, uh, uh, CLS. Uh, part one, part two are separate assignments. Uh, of course, for um, uh, Chieftain, it was all one package, so you'll have to watch, of course, both parts. Before we do that, oh, and um, uh, I know the um, CLS students have heard me say this already, but uh, I think in math classes. But uh, for Chieftain, just wondering why in the world I'm wearing a shirt and tie. How can that be? Well, I just want to project a little bit of normalcy for a change. Okay. So how's this look? Do I look normal now? Thank you. Um, just trying to be a little bit different today. Um, and speaking of being different, I want to start with something kind of different before we move on to checking these exercises. Um, something again that the CLS students have already seen, uh, but the Chieftain students have not. So let me throw this at you. Uh, just a thought. So I'll get to another window here. Um, it's been on my mind uh, lately. Um, stumbled across this old file that I had in my computer, and I thought, hey, why not uh, uh, use it today? Uh, the question is, are you or are you not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? And just a, a, a quick, uh, some quick thoughts here. What does a believer look like? Well, if you find yourself living for fun, that's your main goal in life, is to have fun. Well, you should be living for Jesus. A true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is living for Him. Not living just to have a good time. Having a good time, it, it's nice, but totally optional. Not required, and can get very much in the way of a true life of living for Christ. Um, do you want attention? You try and always get people to notice you. Or, yeah, I know it looks like I'm doing that on these videos, but that's the life of a teacher. But uh, are you living your life trying to get attention on yourself, or are you trying to point folks to Christ? Are, your, tr are you trying to build yourself up, make yourself look good? Or is your goal to glorify the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the author of your salvation? He is the one we should be glorifying and building up, not ourselves. Who are you following? Following your friends? Or are you following your Savior? The one who died on the cross for you. The one who gave everything he could give for you. The one who said, follow me. Who said, take up your cross and follow me. Are you following him? Or are you too busy following your friends? Are you living trying to push the limits? How much can I get away with and still be a Christian? Wrong question. You should not be pushing the limits. That should be far from your mind. Rather, you should be submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you find yourself living most of the time on this side of my board here, I would challenge you to examine yourself. Question whether you are or are not truly a believer. You may be faking it. If, on the other hand, you find yourself living over here, then, yeah, this is pretty close to being the definition of what it means to be a believer. Uh, not exactly, but pretty close. No, we don't, we're not saved by works. But if you are a believer, this is what happens. It follows naturally. Do we make mistakes? Are we always living for Jesus? Are we always pointing to Christ? Are we always glorifying God? Are we always following our Savior? Are we always submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ? No, we, we mess up quite a bit. But generally, we're dwelling over here. We're not trying to live over that, on that side if you're a true believer. So ask yourself that critical question. And on that note, we go back to this, I think. Um... Review exercise number one on page 286. Uh, we've, we discussed this just recently. Um, uh, it is said that a gas fills all the space available to it. Why then doesn't the atmosphere go off into space, trying to fill up all of space? Well, because it's being held down by something. Like, could it be gravity? Yes. Air is matter. Air has weight. The Earth's gravity is pulling it in and keeping it in check, keeping it from being able to float away. Um, number... Uh, 
Number two, I just want to mention number two briefly. I know it was not assigned. I know. But um, he says, why is there no atmosphere on the moon? A little parenthetical note here. As we have discussed in the past, it has been recently discovered. How recently? I'm not at all sure. It's been years now. Not too many years. It has been recently discovered that there actually is a very, very, very thin atmosphere on the moon. Very thin, but very real. Um, so thin that we were able to send astronauts to the moon, I never remember the number, six times, seven times. Um, we sent them to the moon successfully there and back, and the air never got in the way. We never even knew it was there. Not until just recently. But uh, why, or before we knew that, why would we have said there was no atmosphere on the moon? Because the moon doesn't have enough gravitational force to keep an atmosphere. If the moon had a thicker atmosphere, that atmosphere would soon be heated up by the hot surface of the moon when the sun is up, and the molecules would reach escape velocity, and sing, 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 they'd all be gone. The moon is not large enough to hold a, uh, shall I add in the word, a significant atmosphere. It doesn't have enough gravitational force to do so. But moving on to number three, which was a sign. Uh, number three says, um, uh, now of course, you're not allowed to go outside. Well, you are allowed to go to the grocery store, so I suppose you could have um, followed the instructions here of counting the tires on a large tractor trailer that is unloading food at your local supermarket while you have hordes of people jumping all over the truck trying to grab those rolls of toilet paper. <sighs> I'm sorry, anyway. Um, count the tires while there is total chaos all around that truck. With desperate citizens braving the coronavirus trying to get to that isopropyl rubbing alcohol. You are keeping your cool and standing back and watching and you're counting the tires on the truck. Assuming that the massive hordes of people are not stealing the tires. You count the tires and what do you see? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five tires. Uh, do you think that truck has another side to it? I guess so. Um, and do you think it's possible that these might actually be double tires? You've got two here, two there, other side, two more, and two more. Here you've got two there, two there, other side, two more, and two more. The front tires, you only have one and one. Total is 18. You got 18 wheels. That's why they call it a 17 wheeler. <laughs> no, actually, that's why they call it an 18 wheeler, because it has 18 wheels. Now, yeah, I know some of them. I just saw a picture when I was looking for this picture just a little while ago. I saw one that had another set of wheels here. Uh, sometimes you'll see some trucks that are designed to carry very, very heavy loads that have even more wheels than that. So they don't all have 18 wheels, but usually it's 18. Sometimes you'll see one that is having double wheels here. This has one set of two here and two on the other side. But generally speaking, 18 wheelers have, well, 18 wheels. Why is that? Um, the simple reason is this. You've got the weight of the truck divided out over all of the wheels. By taking the weight of the truck, it's that definition of pressure. Pressure, pressure equals force divided by area. The idea is to take the weight of the truck and divide it over a bunch of tires so that you don't have too much pressure on each individual tire. You're trying to minimize the pressure on each tire. If you had just a few tires, maybe suppose you had just six tires, there would be so much pressure on each one, well, it wouldn't work very well. Um, yeah, it wouldn't work well at all. You're minimizing the pressure so that there's less wear on the tires, so the tires don't have to be as tough, you don't have to build them like they were for tanks. Um, it minimizes the pressure, that's about all there is to it. Uh, let's uh, move on to number, fifth, uh, number five. Um, if you go down into a deep mine, well, pretty simple concept here. If you go down in, into a deep mine, you're getting deeper in the atmosphere. The deeper you go in the atmosphere, the more atmosphere you have above you. And the deeper you go, the more pressure there is going to be. So how does the, um, uh, uh, how does he say it? How does the density of air in a deep mine compare with the density of air at the Earth's surface? Down in a deep mine, the density is going to be greater. 
Air is easily compressed. Water doesn't do that. Water doesn't compress. The density of water from the top of the ocean to the bottom of the ocean is practically the same because it doesn't squash. But with air, the deeper you go, the more dense it gets. It gets squashed together. Uh, number. Oh, is there something else I wanted to show you? Another uh, picture? I feel like there's something I'm forgetting. I know there's something I'm forgetting. What was it? Oh, I know. I wanted to show you a quick uh, uh, video. Um, just, uh, th I'm not going to say much about this. In fact, I may say nothing about it. I want you to see if you can tell me what's wrong with this video. Uh, there's something wrong with it in terms of atmosphere. There's something wrong with it in terms of gravity. Um, what else uh, uh, is there something wrong with? That may be uh, about all. Atmosphere, gravity. See how many errors you can find. I sincerely believe that the folks who created the Super Bowl ad really thought they had the physics straight and were creating a funny video based on what they thought was true physics. Well, they messed up big time. Uh, let's see what you think. Um, if you think you can find out what is wrong with it, um, shoot me an email. Not required. Just for fun. Just for fun. Um, but, oh, so I can sort these things out. Uh, tell me, um, put in the subject line, um, commercial. That way I know that I can ignore it for a while if I have to and come back to it later. Uh, so just give me a quick thought if you want to and give the subject line of commercial. What's wrong with this video? Quick. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first moon office. I'm sure there's going to be a few kinks to work through, but no one ever said being a pioneer was easy. Now wait till you see this view. Can you find wrong with the physics in that silly commercial? Do you know what my stop, business stop, 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 go away. Okay, kill that entirely. All right. Uh, now, oh, email. Don't look at that. Oh, that's just, that's nothing. That's, that's okay. But I still need to get rid of it. There. And back to this. I'm losing track of all the things I wanted to show you here. Okay, we move on. Um, number seven. Uh, air bubbles. You got some water here. Oops. You've got some water here. You got an air bubble. The air bubble is going to rise, obviously, because it's displacing more water than its own weight. An air bubble doesn't have a lot of weight. Does an air bubble have any weight? Yes, because an air bubble is made of air. Air has weight. But the buoyant force upward is greater than the weight of the bubble itself. So yes, it's going to rise. As it rises, what happens? As it rises, it enters into areas where the water pressure is less. If the water pressure is less as it rises, it's going to exp expand and expand until it gets to the surface and breaks open. Now, this expansion here in this diagram is a little exaggerated, but it will expand. So the question here is, um, what happens to its mass? Does the amount of air in the bubble change as it expands? No. Same amount of air. It's expanding because there's less pressure on it, but the amount of air inside that bubble does not change. It's becoming less dense as it rises. Um, another way to think of that is when it was down deep, the water pressure was squeezing that air into a smaller package, but it's still the same air. How about the uh, next part of this says, um, where am I? Uh, volume. Does its volume change? Well, yeah. The volume increases as it rises. More space taken up, taken up, but same mass. And the last part of this, how about its density? Well, yeah. As that package of air expands, 
it becomes less and less dense. A really cool place where you can see this. Now, I do not um, uh, recommend this because I, I myself um, am firmly committed to not drinking alcoholic anything. Um, so, I just throw that little disclaimer in there. But I have watched my dad's glasses of beer. A glass of beer is an interesting thing to watch. There might be a, a, some kind of an impurity in here floating around, and that little impurity might be causing bubbles to come up off of it. As that little impurity swirls around in there, the bubbles will come up, and if you study those bubbles carefully, they start off as little, tiny, barely visible bubbles, and as they rise, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. These are terrible looking bubbles, but you get the idea. As those bubbles rise, they actually increase in size. You can see exactly what we're talking about here in number seven by watching that trail of bubbles as they start small and increasingly get larger as they rise. I remember being fascinated by that as a kid. Didn't understand it, didn't know the physics behind it, but it fascinated me nonetheless. Um, now, continuing on to number number 10. Um, you uh, get on a plane, and let's, let's change the example a little bit. Um, many years ago, um, when my 30-something-year-old uh, daughter was only about, how old was she, something like eight or something, uh, we went on a trip to Florida on a plane, one of our few plane trips we've ever taken. And uh, we brought with us some of these little snack pack things. Yeah, they had them back then. Uh, these little plastic containers with a, a plastic wrap on top and it might have cheese and some crackers in there and you open it up and, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, as we're in flight, up how many feet, I don't know, thousands of feet, uh, we're up in flight and I pulled out one of those things from our, our backpack to give to my daughter and I noticed something really strange about it. It was puffed way out. Why would it be so puffy all of a sudden? It looked like it was going to pop open any moment. Because when you're up in the air like that, there is less air pressure. If there's less air pressure, then the normal pressure that was inside that package is going to start trying to push outward against the lesser pressure. It's going to bow out until the pressures are equalized. Uh, but Mr. Perry, um, if there's no pressure up there, how do you breathe? Well, they do pressurize the cabin of the plane. They just don't pressurize it all the way up to the normal 15 pounds per square inch. They don't need to. There's no need to pressurize it all the way to normal atmospheric pressure because we'll do fine at a lesser pressure. How much pressure do they have up there? I've never looked into it to find out. I do not know. But one thing's for sure. It's not normal pressure. How do we know? Because your ears pop, because pack sealed packages expand, so we know it's less pressure, just don't write a band know how much less. Uh, let's move on to number, 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 number 10. Oh, that was 10, number 12. Um, oh, this is kind of cool. I've done this many times. Um, perhaps I should have done it for you guys on the video, but oh well. Um, if you take one of these uh, uh, containers, uh, like you get uh, Coleman fuel in those who go camping a lot, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A steel container, about yay tall, about kind of rectangular like this, about yay tall. Um, a steel container that contains Coleman fuel. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else you could get in a container like that. Maybe it's just Coleman fuel. <laughs> but if you take a container like that, take off the cap. Um, then take a piece of paper, light it with a match, and toss it in the can. It goes in the can, it burns for a little bit, and the burning of the paper in the can causes the air in the can to expand as it heats up but it goes out the mouth of the can because you've got it open. So the air expands, pushes the air out. Then you real quick grab your cap and twist it back onto the can. Now the air in the can begins to cool off once the fire goes out. The air inside cools off. As the air inside cools off, what does it do? It's going to contract and be more dense. It's going to get smaller. As it does that, the outside air pressure will squash that can. It's pretty cool to watch. It takes uh, maybe a minute or two for the process to complete, but you can stand there and watch that can just kind of go 
I have also found that if you then take that can, provided that there were no cracks in it because of the squashing, and sometimes it does crack, if it doesn't crack any place during the squashing process, you can put it onto a burner, um, a flame or a little miniature stove or something, put it on a burner, and expand the air inside the can, and the can will actually, believe it or not, I've done this many times, it's so cool, the can will actually reinflate. The trick there is to get it off the heat before it inflates too much because you do not want it to inflate to the point where it explodes. Um, I don't know what that would be like. It probably wouldn't explode. It would probably just rupture someplace and then go this. But um, I don't want to find out. Uh, so you, when it gets back close to its original size, you take it off the heat really fast. But it's cool to watch it get crushed by the atmosphere and then re-expand as you heat the air up again. Pretty cool. All right. So that's what number um, 12 is all about. And number 12 is using a slightly different um, uh, method than putting the burning paper in there. They're using warm water, hot water. Uh, same concept. Number 13. What I find is that uh, many students have no clue what a picture tube is. Yeah, I know. We're, we're now living in the 2020s. Um, we haven't seen picture tubes in a long time. But old-fashioned TVs, you know, you ever know, uh, wonder why they used to be so big? Uh, you've got your uh, your screen here. Uh, you've got your screen, and that TV kind of went like like this. And uh, in the back of the TV, there's this thing sticking back there, like that sort of. And you've got your screen in here, and the screen is actually not flat. The screen is kind of curvy. It's uh, it's a weird looking thing, and they're huge and very heavy. What's going on with that? Well, most of what's inside that cabinet is the picture tube. A picture tube is a big old, um, if I can take away the cabinet here, take the cabinet away. Inside you've got the picture tube, which is a vacuum tube, very heavy glass container that has in the back of it these uh, things called electron guns. And on the surface it's coated inside with a material that glows when it's hit by the beam coming out of this electron gun. The electrons shoot out of this gun back here and hit this, and any place where it hits it makes the screen glow. So then using magnets around this thing to control the direction the beam goes, it scans the screen and lights up the right dots on the screen and doesn't light up the other dots on the screen and forms the picture. Uh, it's a pretty cool concept. Then we invented color where you've got three guns, red, green, and blue, and they're shooting at little dots that will glow red, green, or blue on the screen. If you look up very, very close at one of these screens, you would see that up close, get your magnifying glass, there are actually red, green, and blue dots that are being lit up by the electrons from the electron guns. Um, ever hear of RGB? RGB re uh, refers to red, green, blue, the primary colors of light that a TV uses. Well, now, of course, we've uh, found better ways to do it. Now the screens are obviously flat. But um, these things are vacuum tubes, meaning that to the best of the manufacturer's ability, there's no air inside this big glass tube. No air in there. So here's the question then. If you throw a brick at that thing, if you break it somehow, is it going to go kaboom? Or is it going to go kaplowy? Kaboom or kaplowy? Well, because it's a vacuum inside there, as soon as that glass is violated, as soon as the glass is broken, the atmosphere is going to cause the whole thing to be squashed. It will implode, not explode. Pretty cool. And they tend to do it with a rather loud bang when they implode. Um, so, moving on. Yeah, if you ever find an old TV, Carefully take it apart, take out that picture tube, and hit the glass with a hammer, and see what happens. Uh, wear goggles, wear gloves, wear protective clothing, and make sure you're in a place where you can easily clean up the mess. Um, but it will implode, not explode. Number 15, uh, vacuum cleaner. It doesn't really pump. It, 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 
It's just blowing air. The vacuum cleaner blows air. As the air goes through the vacuum cleaner, as it goes into the tube, ah, now you've seen this before, this machine, I don't know if you actually saw the machine itself, there's what it looks like. Okay. This thing pretends it's a vacuum, you know what it does, it blows air, pretends it's a vacuum cleaner. If this were a vacuum cleaner, I would have to make the fan go the opposite direction. It would be pulling air in. Is it sucking air in? No. It's causing low pressure in the hose, and because of the low pressure in the hose, the atmosphere is pushing into the tube. And as that air goes into the tube, the pressure in that air is going to be less because the air is moving, so other atmospheric air is going to be pushing in there as well, along with all the dust it's going to carry with it. Pretty cool concept. So how well would this work on the moon? Where there is virtually, not completely, but virtually no air. It ain't gonna work. What happens when you have a fan on the moon and you turn on the fan and the blade starts turning? What happens? Absolutely nothing. The fan turns, there's no air to push. You stand in front of the fan, oh, I wanna be cooled off. And nothing, because there's no air for the fan to push. Propeller-driven airplanes would not work on the moon. Um, cars would spin. Why isn't this plane going anywhere? Well, there's no air. Okay, so no, a vacuum cleaner would not work on the moon. Um, number uh, 16. We talked about this already. Uh, the pump shown in 14.7. Um, it works with, by vacuum. Suppose it worked with a perfect vacuum, which it doesn't. But suppose it worked with a perfect vacuum. How deep a well could be pumped? Well, you're not going to get water from any, a well any farther than about 34 feet, about 10.3 meters, um, because the atmosphere can only push water up about 34 feet and no further. You create a vacuum in that, that pipe, the atmosphere will push the water up 34 feet and no farther. Sorry, it's got to be less than 34 feet deep. Um, number 20, if you could somehow replace the mercury in a mercury barometer with a denser liquid, now that's pretty tough to do. I'm not sure there is any liquid any more dense than mercury. But if you could, because remember, mercury is 13 times more dense than water. Like, whoa. Um, if you could find a, a, a liquid more dense than mercury, what would that look like in a mercury barometer? Uh, how much mercury could be supported by the atmosphere? More, less, or the same. If the liquid is heavier, it's not good. the atmosphere cannot hold as much of it up. Your barometer, instead of being 30 inches tall, could be less. The heavier the liquid, the smaller your barometer could be because the atmosphere can only hold up a certain amount of weight. With a more dense material, a more dense liquid, it takes less of it to equal that weight. So it's going to rise not as far. Uh, that brings us to number 21. It would be slightly more difficult to draw soda through a straw at sea level or on the top of a high mountain. Well, how does a straw work again? We talked about this. I even diagrammed it for you. Um, when you suck on a straw, what are you really doing? You're simply lowering the air pressure inside the straw, enabling the atmosphere to then push the liquid up into the area of lower pressure. It's the atmosphere that's pushing the liquid up the straw. So if you're at sea level, you've got a good bit of atmospheric pressure pushing the liquid up the straw. But if you're at the top of Mount Everest, you have much less pressure. Therefore, you're going to have a, a little bit of a harder time sucking anything up that straw because you don't have as much air pressure pushing the liquid up the straw. You're going to have to suck harder. Um, by the way, I, I, I don't know how true this is, but it makes sense to me. I've heard that uh, that's how vacuum cleaners on the space station or on the space shuttle work. They've got to clean stuff up once in a while. They've got particles of whatever, dust, water particles, blobs of stuff floating around in there all the time with no gravity. Think about it. 
and every now and then they've got to clean things up. How does a vacuum cleaner work on the space station? All they have to do is have a little hose that's hooked up to the outside where there is how much pressure? None. So the air from inside is pushed by the air pressure inside the space vehicle pushed into that little hose and then out it goes. Do they actually do it that way? Somehow I suspect they don't because they can't, they don't want to be throwing their air outside all the time. They need to keep their air. So it's probably just an ordinary vacuum cleaner. Uh, but it's an interesting thought that they could do it that way if they had air to spare. Hey, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe part one ended at number 21. That was a short part one. I should have sent you on to about number 26. Uh, but we stopped at 21, if I remember correctly. So we'll stop this video, and then we'll have um, uh, a part two video to uh, take care of the second half, or <laughs> I don't know, second three-fourths of this review assignment. So for now, it is goodbye, and see you in a bit. Goodbye.